this is Mr. Coates, and this is AP Environmental Science Lecture Number Nine. This uh, lectures on biological sampling techniques. Uh, one of the things that has to do with ecology is how biologists actually sample biological populations. And uh, so let's look at this forest down here. We have this large coniferous forest down here, and it's got all kinds of different organisms in it. And let's say that a, an ecologist wanted to study this forest and find out what were the organisms that are in this forest and how many of them are there and what is the density of all the different species in this. Uh, it would be a huge task to sample even a small part of this forest to get all those things. So uh, researchers use different types of biological sampling techniques in order to make the job a little bit easier so they can get a close estimate. So let's look at some of these techniques. One of the newest ways to sample biological populations is what we call remote sensing. And this, is, this means that we're sampling away from the actual habitat using something like satellites. So satellites can look down on the planet and they can detect different colors, different color variations. And by looking at those different colors, then we can input what each color means. So for example, this is a uh, field area uh, somewhere in Colorado. And uh, basically they uh, took this picture and then they uh, set up the computer to show them what kind of vegetation was in this picture based on uh, how stressed it was. Uh, and uh, so what they did, then they colorized the photo to represent those different types of shades. And so we got dry vegetation and bare ground is in the blue. So that's, of course, this area here and this area. So these are fields that haven't been planted yet, probably. And if you notice, they're little circles. That means that they probably, in the middle, they have a well right there in the middle. And there's an arm on the well that rotates around the field and sprinkles water so that's why they're round. Uh, then you have fields that have already been planted so these are the green ones here and then you have this red stuff here and this is stressed vegetation so in order to figure out what stressed vegetation looked like they had to go down to the ground and, and kind of look at these areas and say hey this area has got stressed vegetation so we're gonna highlight these color variations on the aerial for stressed vegetation and so that's remote sensing and you can do large areas this way. It's very quick, it's very cost effective, and you get pretty good results now that computers are very uh, good at looking at these differences. So that's remote sensing. Now when a uh, biologist wants to sample an area, one of the things that you have to realize is that you don't want to put your personal bias into the sampling. So you would want to go out here and, and just choose, okay, I want to do this one, and I want to do this one, and I want to do this one. And the reason is, is that um, you may be putting some personal bias in that choosing. So what you want to do is that somehow you want to randomly sample your area. So we have this 100 meter square area here, and we want to sample whatever organisms these X's represent. And so obviously we can't sample the whole area, so we want to randomly choose some areas. So these boxes would represent those areas that we want to sample, but how do we choose those boxes? You do it several different ways. You could divide this area into a grid pattern, and then maybe roll a die that represents the numbers of each grid. Rolling die is a random thing, and so that would definitely give you a random area to sample. Another way to do it, it would be possibly throwing darts. You could set up the map on a wall and throw darts at it and uh, hit random areas at that point. Uh, you can also set up computer programs that can randomize and pick areas for you randomly. So the key is to be as random as possible to eliminate any kind of scientist, scientist bias. Okay. Also, the area of what you're going to be sampled depends on what you're sampling. If you're sampling bacteria, obviously your area doesn't have to be that big. However, if you're sampling elephants, you're probably going to have to have a huge area. So your size of area that you want to sample depends on what you're sampling. Now, one of the ways we could sample randomly is using a thing called a quadrat. Quadrat is usually a rectangle or square measurement device, usually of known size. So it, most often in science, we use a meter by meter square. So this is a quadrat here. It's a meter by meter square. 
and you go out to wherever you're going to sample and you either place it based on the map or when you get there you can just randomly toss it out there and wherever it lands that's where you sample. And so in this case what you would do is that maybe you'd count how many different species are in here and that would give you species richness. So if you had like 50 species in here then your species richness would be 50. It might give you population density. So here's this plant here, and it looks like maybe this plant's the same plant, and maybe there's another one down here somewhere. And so you find out how many individual plants of that same species are in that one meter squared, and you might get four plants per meter squared. And that would be a population density that you could extrapolate out to the whole population. And then you get species diversity. So there's uh, basically a 50 species in this, so is that more diverse in this area than say an over area over here where you sample again. So you can look at species diversity that way. So this is called a quadrat. Okay. Right, the next type of sampling technique is called a transect. A transect is a linear sampling technique. So once again you would choose two points in your, pop, in your uh, sample area randomly and you would tie a rope or a chain uh, between those two points going across your habitat. And this rope or chain is marked every so far, maybe every meter, maybe every five meters, ten meters, depending on what you decided. And every time you get to one of those meters, you basically write down what that line touches, so what species. So if we had a mark right in this area in this line, we would mark down that it's touching this species of coral right in this area. Um, and then further on down there's another one and so we'd write down whatever species we're touching and if we have one here then we're writing down whatever this species is. So this is called a transect. Um, the good thing about transects is that you know where your starting and beginning points are. You could plot them on a map and then you could come back again in the future and you could actually string the same line in the same area and see how the ecosystem changes over time. Researchers have been doing this with coral reefs for quite a long time and they have pretty good re, uh, data and pictures on how coral reefs have changed over the last 20-25 years in some places. And these have become very helpful in protecting coral reefs. So This is called a transect. Now you could also use transects and quadrats in conjunction. So in this case we're uh, sampling a rocky uh, tidal pool estuary area here and they have a transect that goes across here that they mark and every once in a while there's a little mark on the transect and at that mark then they place a quadrat and then they look at whatever the species they're looking for in this quadrat or they count all the species in that quadrat and then going down a little bit further there's another mark and they would place a quadrat there and okay, once again this uh, allows for repeatability again and it allows you to better determine your distance, how many times you're going to do this. Now once we get all this data, what do we do with it? One of the things we can do is that we can dump it into what we call a biodiversity index or indices if we're talking about multiple ones. So a biodiversity index basically is a mathematical computation of the biodiversity based on estimations of the sample uh, area. And uh, so biodiversity is basically just a measurement of the different species in an area. And what you like to do is that by looking at these indices in different areas, you can compare the two areas and determine which one has a higher diversity. So if you have a mangrove ecosystem like this one here, and you count all the species in this area, and you put it into an indice, and then you go to another place that might have maybe some pollution or higher levels of pollution in the water, and you take a biodiversity indice in the same size area, and then you can compare those two indices and determine which one is more diverse and maybe the pollution has an impact on the biological diversity index and there are several different types the one type we're going to talk about is called um, the Simpson index and we'll get to that in a second now one of the things I said we could mention e earlier is species richness so species richness is the total number of species in the area so we have a quadrat here and in order to make counting easy what they did is they divided this quadrat into it looks like decimeters actually so there's one two three there should be about ten each way so those are probably decimeters and they're counting the coral colonies within each quadrat using those decimeters to help them narrow down the area so that's species richness. Then you can also measure species evenness. How evenly species are represented in the area. Uh, do most of the individuals belong to just one species? So we can use both of these together in the Simpsons Index. 
The Simpsons Index includes both species richness, the number of species, and how evenly distributed those species are in one single number. So we can use this, we could sample this tide pool, get all the organisms here, and we could get both species richness and species evenness and then combine them in a Simpsons Index. So let's see how Simpsons Index works. Now, this is just a way to measure diversity and you don't need to memorize this equation at all. So here's the Simpson index. D is the number we're looking for. All right, and we'll tell, talk about what D means in a little bit. But basically, little n here is the total number of organisms of a particular species, okay? So individuals of a particular species here. Um, and then n is, the n minus one is that number minus one. And so you, what you do for every, spe every species, you add those up. So let's say you had three species and uh, so the first one had five individuals, so this would be five, and this would be times four, so that would be 20, and then you add it plus the next species. N down here, then, is the total number of organisms of all species, so your total population of all species added together, and uh, then, of course, times N minus N1 here. And this is a sigma sign here. This means you add up all of these for each individual species. All right, so let's look at some numbers here. So we have five species in this uh, example here. And so this is the number of individuals in each species. So the species A had 12, this one had three, seven, four, nine. And then they do the N minus one, and then they do that multiplication, and then you add it up. And so this gives you your top number. So this is this number here in our Simpsons index. Um, then our bottom number is at the total number of individuals. So they count all these up to get big N and then they times it by a one short of itself and they got this number here and then you take the first number divided by the second one and this gives you this number here. Now according to the Simpsons index is that basically one, the closer you are to one, uh, the, the lower biodiversity is. So the further you get from one, so if you had another one that you measured and it was 0 0.052, then this one would have a higher biodiversity than this one, according to the Simpsons Index. And uh, Simpsons Index is a very easy way to measure biodiversity. There's others out there. There's the Shannon Index. Um, and then you can perform all kinds of statistical analysis on these as well. All right, so let's look at some, bio, some biodiversity problems. What I want you to do is that, uh, read over my uh, intro here and then answer each one of these questions uh, after you pause the video here. And after you answer all them, then play the video and I'll show you how I solved them. Okay, so pause the video now. All right, let's see how to solve these then. Okay, we have a one meter quadrat, that one meter square quadrat that uses sample vegetation in a 200 meter square field. Quadrat reveals 70 individuals of species X, 20 of species Y, 15 of species Z. What is the species richness? Now remember, species richness is just the number of different species you have. So we only have three species in this, so our answer is three for species richness. Okay, so that one was pretty easy. Let's look at the next one. Okay, now we have, what is our density? Remember, density is the number of individuals or number of organisms per unit of area. So let's look at our density for species X in the entire field. So we have a one meter square quadrat equaled uh, 70 individuals. Um, and so we have a 200 meter field. So if we have 70, and I'll make this individuals over one meter squared, then we could multiply that by our field size, 200 meters squared per one field. And then that equals 1400 individuals because meters squared cancels out. So meters are 1400 individuals for the field here. Oops, field. All right, so that is the correct answer here. 1400 individuals in the field based on our field size and our number of individuals per meter squared. Let's look at the last one then. Simpson's index number for the quadrat. Okay, so this is a rather lengthy one. So the first of things we're going to do is get our species here. So X, we had 70. Uh, y, we had 20. And Z, we had 15. All right. And so our total here was 5. And so 105 individuals total. Now remember, 
our top number is n times n minus 1, and that's for the first one, plus, and we have to put that in, n2 times n2 minus 1, plus the second one, n3 times n3 minus 1. Okay, and so that gives us 70 times 69 plus 20 times 19 plus 15 times 14. All right, so when we multiply these out, we get uh, 4830 plus uh, 380 plus 10 and so that gives us 5 4 2 0 so then we want to find big N times big N minus 1 so that's 105 times 104 and that equals 10920 so then we find our species index which is D equals this 5 4 2 0 that we got from up here divided by this one here, which is 10920. And what that gives us is a 0.496. Okay. And so then we could have another one that we basically compared this to, and we see maybe this one's more diverse than the other. Remember, the closer the number is to 1, the less diverse it is. So this one's pretty close to 1, so this is probably not a very diverse uh population and you can tell that just because there's three different species. Alright, now there's some comprehensive questions I want you to answer. So pause this slide, go on and write down your answers for the class. If you need to, you can rewind the lecture and go back and get these answers. Make sure you write these down for class and I'll grade them when I grade your notes. You should also have a question you don't know the answer to. Hope this was helpful.